Hello and welcome to the show. Tonight we have Miss Joanne Richards. She is the executive director of the educational nonprofit Earth Defense Headquarters. Tonight she will be reporting on her husband, Captain Mark Richards, and her father in law, Major Ellis Lloyd Richards Jr., who were both involved with the top level military intelligence operations since World War II. Many of these included contact with battles with various alien species. Miss Joanne Richards, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Why don't you try to take some of our listeners back to um, your father-in-law, information about your husband, how they were involved sure. in this, and bring us up to kind of to date to where now he is classified as a, in my opinion, a political prisoner. Exactly. Sure. All right. Let's see. Uh, my, I, I like to mention both of Mark's uh, grandfathers before I get to his father, because both of them, uh, his grandpa Taylor and his grandpa Richard, both worked with Nikola Tesla on his various projects. And um, let's see, grandpa Taylor like helped fly, or he was on an airship that was um, using a Tesla engine as it was being like tested as it flew across the United States, and he got off before it was it exploded. Um, he was also one of Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders and one of the original like Men in Black Secret Service guys. He was murdered uh, in the twenties, I guess, um, something like that. Yeah, in the in the twenties, because my mother-in-law was like six at the time. And then um, Grandpa Richards was a brilliant electronics engineer, and he was involved with a lot of think tanks. He was involved with the Manhattan Project. He, both, both grandpas had ties to whatever president, you know, was in office, I think. And, um, so, and I don't know much, much more about them, but he, he was, Grandpa Richards was also murdered. Um, and then Mark's dad... Let's see, it grew up um, basically in the um, Chicago area, uh, Indiana, Illinois, um, Chicago area, and he joined the Army Air Corps as we were going into World War II, and then we know it became the, the Air Force. And even before he, you know, while he was still in high school, uh, the, the family lineage is on that side is based German, and there's also Scotch and, and in, Scottish and English, um, on his mom's side, um, Mark's mom's side. And then um, when, I'm thinking, when Mark's dad was still in high school, he was sent to Europe, like on an errand for the president, basically, because his father couldn't go. And he ended up in Germany. Uh, Ger the Germans wanted him to defect and become a Nazi officer. And he said no, but they showed him a lot of secrets that he you know, promptly came back to the United States and um, shared that with our government. Also, while he was still probably high school age, there was some uh, bad alien activity going on in the American Southwest, and his dad couldn't go, so he was sent down there to deal with it with um, other young men like Tom Mix, the, the cowboy actor, and Barry Goldwater, various men, young rich men who wanted to help the government, but... Yes, you know, so they were kind of like unofficial government agents. So they, they were dealing with that. So his dad was dealing with alien things since he was a young man. Now let's see, Mark grew up in, not, not the shadow, but his dad was in the Air Force. Uh, he not, well, he retired officially in 1965 or 6 when Admiral Nimitz died. And Admiral Nimitz had been... Um, on the side in charge of an international security agency called International Security. It was formed by the UN in the late 40s. And then when he died, Mark's dad took over. So while maybe the public thought he had retired, he was secretly running this intelligence agency. And when, whenever there was a threat to the whole planet, you know, you know all of humanity um, from the on-world or off-world, this agency took care of it, and you had uh, people from all different countries working together to um, save humanity. Well, you know, most people thought we were all at the Cold War with each other. I mean, we were, but uh, we also worked together with other countries to help 
protect the, the planet. Would it be safe, um, let me but, ask you this, would it be safe to say if someone saw the first Men in Black, kind of like <laughs> when uh, Will Smith was getting an understanding of this always a galactic blah, whatever that, that term they used at the time, against the planet, uh -huh. but we're not supposed to know about it. Our job is to make sure that we preserve life here on planet Earth. Would it be something similar to that or not necessarily? Well, I it, probably yes, because... You know, I've often, that's one of my favorite movies, and I often joke with Mark, it's like, so, like, do we have these places on Earth that are like these secret UN things where the different aliens are coming and going? And he said, yeah, we do. And he, he told me about a building in England where it's just that. And, or in that particular building used to be, it's probably somewhere else now. But, um, so there's a little more of that going on than we know of. You, you, you think it's funny, you know, the funny scene in, um, I guess it was Star Wars, whether it's, you know, the bar, and mm -hmm. you have all these different aliens drinking together. Well, they have those kind of things out in space. There was a, a time when Mark was on a training uh, mission with uh, a, a raptor fleet, and they did their war games out in space, and they ended up at this, like, rest station slash bar, and all these different aliens were there. I was like, huh, just, just like the movie. How about that? So... <laughs> Wow. So it, it, it's yeah, it's amazing. So Mark grew up with all this from the time he was born because his dad, as a military officer in the Air Force, um, one of my favorite stories is that there's an Air Force base. It's now deactivated, but that's about fifteen twenty minutes north of where I live. And his dad, Mark's dad, was stationed there. And in 1952, before Mark was born. Some flying saucers flew in right to the base, and the officers and their wives are all at the pool, and the alarm goes off, and the, the women are, you know, sitting there watching, and the guys have to run down to their, their jets and their hangars and, you know, come out in their jets and go deal with it. And Mark's dad rolls out of his hangar with a human-built flying saucer because the Air Force had some built for them by a, a company called Avro in Canada. So, uh, long story short, they go out, they did whatever they did. You know, I, I don't know if there was a battle or whatever, but um, our guys all came back. Then one flying saucer came back and out walks this really tall reptilian who we became friends with called Prince Naga, and he's a raptor. He looks just like the raptors in Jurassic World. And um, he became friends with our military. He came as an ambassador, the empress of their their empire decided it was time for them to start being friends with the humans and so he started talking and teaching our you know government and military people some things we needed to know about space and aliens and it just you know blossomed from there this lovely relationship and um, when mark was born a couple months after he was born a huge contingency and this is documented in richard dolan's book this huge contingency of flying saucers came back into the san rafael marin area and they flew into the Lake District. We have a series of reservoirs here. And what they came to do was acknowledge Mark's birth and do like a naming ceremony with him like you do in The Lion King where you hold the baby up. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I love, I love these stories. So Mark's been around aliens his whole life. He, he officially met some in 1961 when his dad was helping run a interstellar treaty conference held in southern England. So Mark got to see all kinds of aliens coming and going, and he got to play with alien children, and it just never phased him, I don't think. It, he never sounded scared. He was more curious and more excited to play with just, you know, these kids, mm -hmm. because their their parents had come as, as ambassadors and delegates to these conferences. So, you know, like it, it's a weird childhood. But it suits Mark just fine. So he's been around all this weird stuff his whole life, and it just kind of evolved into, you know, that's what he ended up doing with his military career. Most of it was dealing with aliens and UFOs, and, you know, there we are. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, obviously, at some point, I mean, all of this was top secret. You didn't know any of this right. stuff. We all got married. No. Um, things... I mean, how did some of this come into play to where, I guess, was there a shock factor to you when these stories came <laughs> to light to you, or did you take it at first, you know, face value? 
Well, you mentioned that Mark is a political prisoner, which is true. In 1982, he was arrested for masterminding a murder that happened here in Marin County that he absolutely had nothing to do with. He was off on one of his missions when this murder took place. Some kids that were working for him uh, supposedly killed um, one of their, like, they were they were doing a remodel of this guy's house. That was one of Mark's cover businesses. And, you know, the guy ends up dead, and the body floats up in the bay, and the kids, they all get caught, or, you know, the kids decide to blame it on Mark. Oh, he masterminded it. So Mark got life without parole. One of the kids got 25 to life. The other kid got full immunity for changing his story to make it be what the, the district attorney could work with. So Mark's been in prison or incarcerated since 1982. I met him in 1997. We courted for many years and got married, and we've been married for almost 16 years. So he didn't, that's not the first thing he told me when we first started writing and visiting. Basically, I knew he was writing a big family history, and eventually, and I, I started a publishing company, and eventually he started, and he, I was doing some like background research for him for some of the things he was working on, and never really knowing where it fit into any of the pieces. Now that I'm reading his stuff, I, oh look, that's a piece that I researched for you way back when. He goes, yeah. Um, and he, it, was, it was funny because it's not like we sat there in the visiting and he said, oh, by the way, this is what I used to do with the military. It was more like he started giving me like reports and things to sell through my publishing company, and then I formed a nonprofit. And I'm looking at this, oh, you know, I'm having to type it, and it's this thing about, oh, he's gone in space, and he's met these cool cats. And, oh, my gosh, they had a battle, and he almost just died. And this is, that was basically how I learned about the beginnings of the depth of his military experience in space. But by then, when I tell everybody, by then, we had already been together for several years, so I trusted him implicitly. And for some really odd reason, it just did not shock me at all that, mm -hmm. oh, okay, this is what he did. I don't know why. I just knew he was telling me the truth, and it wasn't weird to me at all. And called me crazy, but um, it just didn't really shock me. So. <laughs> Yeah, most people would think if they received a letter like that, they would, you know, think that the other person, you know, this is a really bizarre story. I can't, I can't connect any dots. Maybe I shouldn't even write anymore, you know. Um, and and I can relate um, to our listeners. I do a lot of uh, prison uh -huh. ministry writing myself. Oh, uh huh. Which uh -huh. is, uh, I hear some uh, s s some pretty detailed stories myself. I do write prisoners. Yeah. So uh -huh. um, there's a connection you and I have. I also own a book publishing oh, company. Oh, very good. So uh -huh. uh, I, I get it, you know, yeah. it, when you hear oh, the stories, you, you take them in, you take them at face value, you try to help add to the story as opposed to decipher and tear apart the story. Right. We're, and, you know, one of the, one of the best things um, a few years into this, and I had started the nonprofit, which wasn't supposed to be originally just about UFOs and stuff. It was supposed to in include a lot of other things, but this is kind of my focus. And by then I knew enough, um, I knew enough, because that was 2004 that I went to the first conference, I knew enough to know that this is what Mark was involved with, and yes, I totally believed him. And I met Richard Dolan at that first conference and, you know, bought his book, for like his U.S. and the security states, sort of, a lot of the things he writes about are things my husband was personally involved with. It's like I'm looking at you, like, oh, well, there's that, oh, there's that, and then so it was, it was a validation. It's like, oh yeah, oh look, this is one of my husband's things. And then Mark would go on later. He, you know, independently, Mark had, would have written like a longer, like the, the longer version of the snippets that Richard Dolan is able to put in his book, because he can't, you know, he's putting in as much as he can, but he can't write lengthy stories, and he doesn't know. The Freedom of Information Act and the documents he's able to get a hold of is not going to include all the details that my husband recalls. So, mm -hmm. so it's, you know, it was a lovely validation, and there have been other people along the way that have validated things that my husband has said and reported on. So, mm -hmm. so that's nice. It isn't me just always believing him. <laughs> right. Now, I, I know for uh, a fact that there are some underground bases in New Mexico. 
I don't know yeah. to oh, the yeah. extent of the details of it. I don't know what goes on in there. I don't know if they're still operational. <laughs> Do you have any information about some of the underground bases in New Mexico or not necessarily? Well, I'm sure that um, I don't know much about like Sandia and Los Alamos, but they, they I'm sure they have underground portions. Now, the one I know the most about uh, is the Dulce Base in northern New Mexico, almost up near the Colorado border. And as you know, because that's how you found me, I'll be speaking there in June at mm-hmm. their conference. And what's interesting is, and it's not as active as it was, but it's they started building that in the 40s, and then it became hu- you know, hugely active, and they, they brought a lot of, of, like, thousands of kidnapped victims, mostly women and children, and did lots of horrendic, horrific experiments on them, you know, genetics, sexual experiments, breeding experiments, mind control, just all kinds of, and they just did weird sexual things with the victims and had orgies and stuff, and, and our government allowed it to be built and allowed it to ha- go on, you know, for scientific reasons, and then even, and some of our <laughs> probably less than wonderful congressional people came and participated in some of those orgies, but um, the government, I don't think they had really, they hadn't kept it under control, and I don't know if they really knew how bad it got, mm-hmm. um, but by by late in the late 70s, especially by 79, some of the military had discovered how bad it was and getting out of control and what was happening to the victims. You know, so the the knights in shining armor who who want to take care of the women and children decided, well, the heck with this, we're going to form a rescue mission and they basically got permission by the president Carter and then he kind of turned his head and you know, didn't watch what was happening, but the military organized um, a rescue mission with like Delta Force and mm, I can't remember all the groups, um, but there was an NSA portion in there and whatever. And Mark's dad was basically in charge, and then Mark was in charge of like one of the units because they went in through different entrances and they rescued uh, 3,500 people. They rescued 3,500 people. They blew up a major portion of the base and captured a couple of alien craft, and it, it was basically out of commission till the early 90s when it came back online, but not as big, and most of the stuff had to be taken to bases off the planet or in different places around the world. So, uh, But, you know, what's interesting, and so I, I never wanted to talk about that place, and in my early years of doing this, that's what people wanted to talk about the most. And I have a report because Mark was asked to help edit this report that was going to be presented to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 2001, because by then, you know, you had a lot of researchers leaking about this base and what had been found out about the area and what had been gone on, and, you know, the whole Phil Schneider story and the Tom Costello um, information that had all come out. So some group of men, I'm assuming military, put together this report about what was being leaked out and, you know, what they knew, and then about this rescue mission in 1979. So he's listed in there, but um, he he doesn't talk about it much, hardly at all. I just try to ask questions, and, you know, he'll give me brief answers if he can, but he doesn't really talk about that one much at all because it was really horrific, and it was just really bad. But um, what I was going to say is I I never thought I'd go there because I thought, oh, this is a horrible place and whatever. And then I started, you know, looking around for different conferences. Well, maybe, you know, these people, you know, just trying to get more speaking opportunities. And I contacted them. And they said, sure, come speak. And that was last year. And I flew into Albuquerque and drove up there, drove up there and absolutely fell in love with the area and the Apache people that are there. And, you know, to this day they have, active UFO sightings like all the time Mm -hmm. and so I don't know what's still going on at that base Mark was fine with me going there he said just don't go up to the Mesa or don't you know don't get too close because there's things he didn't say humans he said there's things that still patrol the area it's like okay I'll Mm -hmm. stay down at the hotel Mm -hmm. you know I'm fine with that 
But um, And there's a lot of Bigfoot sightings or people can hear, you know, like Bigfoot howling or whatever kind of noise they make, and they'll find evidence, you know, tracks and nests and things. So there's a lot of Bigfoot and UFO sightings still going on there, and it's just, it's a, it's a lovely place. It's, oh, it was beautiful. So I'm going back again, like I said, next month to speak again, mm-hmm. and um, I can't wait. The, the people are just amazingly wonderful. So, mm-hmm. it makes it yeah. you know, It's funny you should say the, um, you know, missing people, missing children, because um, I was talking with some people not too long ago, and we were saying, you know, where are all these missing children going? <laughs> all these people, there's hundreds of thousands of people yeah. every single year yeah. that just totally yep. end up missing. There's no DNA found, no bones, nobody's being buried. There's no reports. They just like vanish. And then when you said that these people have gone, where do you think they take them now if they're not going there? Or do you have a, a theory? I, I do. And if they're not taking, if they're not taking them to underground bases, a lot of them are taken off the planet and you know, basically sold to the highest bidder um, for either slavery or sex slavery or reproduction because many species can't reproduce on their own anymore. So... Females are used for just like the surrogate womb, but um, it's it. And if if men are taken, it's usually just for meat. But who knows? The other the other thing. So that's mostly for the women and children. Mm-hmm. And you know, you you like especially when this whole serious stuff started. You know, we were hearing of like millions of people. You know, whole whole cities there have been destroyed, and millions of people were refugees. Well, most of those refugees like never made it to Europe or wherever in the Middle East they were going, a ton of them were taken off planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and we know, I don't know how we know, but my husband still has very credible sources uh, that there is a negative reptil- or reptilian species backing ISIS. So, you know, and they are like responsible for the, the most of the kidnappings that happen on this planet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. You brought up the uh, the fact of you know secret space program, a military secret space program. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you know about it? How did it come into play? Is it still in effect, or do you know? I hope so. Oh, yes, it is. Okay. But what I know is, in well, after World War II, a couple of things. Well, after World War II. The Air Force contacted the Rand Corporation down in Southern California and said, hey, can you build us this rocket that'll, you know, go up and come back down? And they did, and they published a little book about it with their plans, and I have a copy. You could you used to be able to get it, like, off their website, and I hope you still can. But <clears throat> So we've had rockets and spacecraft up in space since the late 40s, and then in the late 50s, A couple of scientists, Freeman Dyson and Theodore Taylor, who happens to be like a great uncle or some kind of cousin to Mark. He was related to Mark's mom. And they developed and designed what was called the Orion Space, um, the Orion, well, spacecraft. But it was battleship size spacecraft that would use atomic bombs to launch and propel themselves throughout space Mm -hmm. and what's interesting and they 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 would the crews would be small the majority of the the spacecraft would be like for the atomic you know bomb and launching you know the whole engine part um was because mark said when he was on it, it you didn't use a very large crew but publicly uh they said that they said they scrapped the program because they were coming up with Apollo. But basically, Apollo was the cover civilian program to cover the, the money that was being funneled to this secret program. So it never really died. And what you had was a, called the Orion um, Space Fleet. Basically, we called it the Deep Space Fleet. And you had nine battleship size aircraft or spacecraft, and then smaller support vehicles or space vehicles whatever and the u.s funded and built two of them like you had russia china japan france germany you know several other countries built built some and two corporations built some so 
you know, we built two, two corporations built two, the others were built by other countries around the world. Because kind of part of this whole international security, you know, everybody's going to work together to defend the planet. They would launch them. I think they had to finish assembling them in space. A lot of the times they were parked right over the Antarctic, which is probably why we have a big hole in the ozone there. Mm-hmm. And then they would, you know, I don't know how often they, like, traveled around. I know Mark was involved with at least one or two missions that I know of where he was actually the captain of one of them. His dad was, like, the general of the fleet for a time. And uh, the mission they did right before the Dulce thing was just, like, a couple months before the Dulce thing where they went out into space and Mark's ship met a lovely cat species and they were going out to help, like, with an alien conference of some kind. And there was an ambush by one alien, ambushed another alien base. And so there was a battle. And, and again, like, this is one of the first things I read of his, you know, thing. And he had done stuff years before, but he never gives me anything in chronological order. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's okay. But here I'm reading this report about, oh, look, there's this cat species. Well, that's cool. Well, here's some more about the raptors. And here's some more about the English have this cool top secret thing. And, and then you read this battle that didn't last long, and my guy is almost dead. Because <laughs> his ship, I don't know if it crashed or, you know, ran into something. I don't know what exactly happened. I don't remember. But it's like, it, it's not fun reading the reading the reports when he almost dies, and that happens a lot. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it was, so I would like to, and they upgraded the ships over the years with, with you know, different systems of uh, navigation and propulsion and things. So I doubt they're still using atomic bombs. Now, I don't know if the deep space fleet, international security supposedly is not active anymore because his dad was in charge and his dad is dead. And I guess, you know, publicly, you know, nobody took over supposedly. I kind of like to think that it it's still running, but who knows? He won't admit to that. Um, there is, we do have a space fleet out there. Um, I don't know who's running it exactly, but... I, I know it's out. I know it's still out there because you have a lot more people now talking about the space program, and there are things still going on in space that we need to deal with. And sometimes other alien species that we're allies with, you know, they'll help us or they'll work on it. But one of the things Mark's been telling me recently is that a lot of times when you hear about like military uh, helicopters or plane, you know, crashes or accidents and you know, oh, now we've just lost a couple guys. A lot of times, those are faked, mm-hmm. and and hopefully this has not happened to any family member that I hear is hearing this talk. But you know, a lot of times, the families hear, oh, they've been lost in a helicopter crash, or they've been lost in a training accident or mission, and whatever. And a lot of times, what's happening is these guys come back from combat where they've seen bad stuff, especially. If they're coming back from the Middle East right now, they're, a lot of them are seeing alien activity, and it's not good. Or they're just seeing alien activity, and, it, well, anyway, it can be scary. Um, and a lot of them will be given a choice. Do you want to have your mind washed, like the Men in Black movie? Mm-hmm. Do you want to be killed, or would you like to go join the secret space program? And a lot of them, off they go. Mm-hmm. So maybe their friends and family think they're dead, and they're still alive, and they're off the planet somewhere, serving, still serving. Mm -hmm. And they're like, that's a lovely choice, you know? It's like, I'd rather not be dead or lose my mind, so sure, I'll go. Um, So there's hundreds of thousands of humans that are living off the planet right now, and some of them are, you know, military that have decided to join the Secret Space Program. Some are people who have, like, been kidnapped from here and maybe rescued out there somewhere, but they can't really come back because... You know, how do you come home and talk about, oh, I've been, you know, living as a captive of aliens for these many years. But, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So they're, they're off planet somewhere, safe. And so apparently we do have a pretty robust secret space program. Well, let me ask you this. Where, where would, you know, these vessels be parked or stored around or in a position to be close enough to the world, uh, you know, yeah. in case of a potential danger or threat i mean a lot of people have telescopes they would be looking or is it interdimensional to where it doesn't matter if they have telescopes and they're looking or not they won't be able to see anything oh that's a good point i know at at some point or you know in the earlier years the orion space fleet was like i said parked a lot of the times over the antarctic because nobody was looking Mm -hmm. and 
you know, so I don't know if that's, you know, if what's what we use now, I don't know if that's where they're, they are, because, again, who's down there? <laughs> right. You know, you, you know, you can't see a lot down there. Um, I mean, I know the Nazis still have a base, or the Germans still have a base there, and, you know, other other science groups have bases there and stuff, and we probably do, but I don't know. But, um, you know, so who, I, I'm not sure. if I don't. I would love to ask him, and maybe he'll tell me, but um, who knows? So, you know, sometimes we have to just... I, that, that's a good question. I don't know. Maybe we go park out around the other side of the moon where people can't see well, it. And that's the next and, thing I was going to ask you was, <laughs> you know, has what, has your there? husband brought up anything about the quote unquote the dark side of the moon, which was one of the Transformer movies um, that kind of gave an interesting piece on why we had to get to the moon as quick as we had to was to try to pick up quote unquote alien technology. Do you know anything yeah. about that, or is that something that has never been brought um, up? Oh, it's been brought up. And it's funny because that's probably the one Transformer movie where he suggested I watch because <laughs> I'm not really into Transformers, but um, that's probably because I, I think he said, you know, there's a Transformer movie that they, they're a lot like aliens or something. I don't remember. But anyway, I, I know that on the dark side of the moon there are lots of alien bases. Mm -hmm. You know, some are not active anymore, but... Um, a lot of species have bases there. That's pretty much all he'll say, because he's not going to tell me exactly which species, and he's not going to say where they are and that kind of thing. Um, he will acknowledge, and, and we've known they've been there for a long time. And, like, in the, the late 70s, we were actually, we as in, like, the United States military, was building a base on the moon in the old Copernic, well, not the old, in like the ruins of the Caper uh, an alien base in the Copernicus crater. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the one of the missions that he had to write about was there was an alien invasion fleet in September of seventy seven coming towards the Earth to you know invade the invade the planet. And what it did first, what, we were we were on the moon. We had Marines there. We were also going to like install this really cool new telescope thing and. There were, um, what do I want to say, there were like space cannons out in space near the moon to, to protect things, and, you know, they blew those up, they, they blew or fired like neutron bombs at the moon, frying basically our Marines, and there were other negative aliens on the moon that got some of our other Marines, so they attacked our base on the moon and destroyed that. And I don't know if we've ever rebuilt one, because that's nothing he's going to tell me. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I do know, you know, there's, there it has been a lot of stuff up there. And, you know, I've heard from other people that, like, the Germans have a base up there now. And it's like, okay, well, that wouldn't surprise me, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, and, and Mark's been to the moon. Mark's been a lot of places out in space. And, um He's been to the moon and, and tells me how beautiful it is to look back at Earth from the moon. And it's like, oh, this <laughs> sounds very romantic. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me ask you this. Most, the most common um, known alien species would be classified as the alien greys. Um, that is okay. uh, probably one of yeah. the most common that most people can relate probably. to. I think that is what was found at Roswell, but don't hold me to it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know either, but uh, <laughs> what, what would be some of the other ones? You did mention a cat species. You mentioned a there, reptilian a, species. Yeah, there, well, there's there's several reptilian species. There's um, two originated here on the planet, the raptors that we talk about a lot, and they're basically Mark's best friends. They still look like the, the dinosaurs from Jurassic World because they left the planet, but they didn't think they'd been gone. They thought they'd only been gone like... 36 years and they'd actually 36,000 years and they'd been gone like millions of years so they they're still they still to this day look like beautiful dinosaurs um they have a vast empire out in space they also have several bases on this planet uh the the ones of their species that were on earth and on the moon and on mars when the a big asteroid hit millions of years ago they evolved into a more human looking species called the reptoids who are not friends with their ancestors the raptors and and the, these reptoids are the ones that back terrorist activities in the middle east and with north korea and even like 
incidents at malls, you know, malls and different terrorist activities. They're, you know, they do not have our best interests at heart. There are other species, reptilian species, that originate in space. Some are friendly and, and some are not, like the Dracos people hear about <clears throat> are not friendly. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, uh, there's two cat species I know of. There's this beautiful um, species that he met in 1979, and I think he calls them like Chatelaine. But they're tall, they like to die, they use ESP, they talk telepathically to you, they hum, they have like a singing language, they, can, they have wings, they can fly. So I, I can't wait to meet them, they sound really cool. There's another panther-like species that's from space that, you know, they, when they walk upright, they look very, I mean, they walk very human-like, but they still have fur. They look like big cats. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, they're, they're scientists and, and archaeologists, and they come here to the planet to, like, there's one in particular I talk about, and she comes to, like, find different places on the planet where her species have, you know, been at before. But basically, they're very friendly unless you provoke them and they have to defend themselves. Then they're very capable of defending themselves, but I want to meet them, too. Mm -hmm. There's big, giant beetles that are like the size of a Volkswagen or a pickup truck and um, or like a semi. You know, it just depends on whether you're like a worker bee or a fighter bee. They're not bees, but, you know, or it depends on which cast you're at. Mm -hmm. There's also a little, there's some, some types that are co very communal, and as a colony, they'll look like a cloud, but in, if like one of them is separate from the rest of them, it looks like a little blob of shiny oil, very beautiful, um, and Mark's friends with them, and they talk telepathically, and they like eat ammonia, or yeah, ammonia and methane, and um, so they're, they're out and about. And then there's some cool, there's several that are from the ocean. Um, some, you know, sometimes the dolphins are really an alien species. There's others, um, like if you think you're seeing a mermaid, it's an alien species. Mm -hmm. um, there's, mm -hmm. if, did you ever see the movie Abyss? Yes, I have. Oh, I love that movie, and I love it even more now. The lovely jellyfish type being that was deep, deep down in the ocean mm -hmm. is, the closest thing I know to describe this, the species called the Nereids, and they're interdimensional. They're interdimensional. That's I know that, and, and like they'll become whatever you want to see, they'll become that. So if you want to see a mermaid, they'll turn themselves into a mermaid. But to come on land and interact with humans, they have to take on the body of something that's just drowned. So when Mark met one, a couple of them at this conference in England when he was a kid in 61, the little girl whose father was like the king and he was like coming as the delegate, um, she had to take on the body of like a little girl who had just drowned. Mm -hmm. And then she could like interact with the humans. Um, so that's, that's odd and weird and, you know, but not, you know, it's just awkward to watch, but, um, but that's one kind. Um, what else? And there's some little bugs. There's a lovely little, um, they're not really a beetle, but they're very close in looks to what we call a water bear here on the planet. So they look like a little beetle, but they don't like have a, a hard shell or anything. Um, that is an interdimensional species, and they also can cloak themselves. And they came to the planet in 1978 when they were tricked into thinking nobody lived here because another alien species wanted their cloaking technology and their interdimensional technology. And, but anyway, you know, their, their ship land or crashed here, and several groups, including our military and other militaries and, you know, corporate groups and bad New World Order people were all racing to get it. And anyway, the U.S. won, and, and Mark had a lovely first contact with them. So a lot of these species, he can speak either their language or he can speak to them telepathically. And he helped, he and his, his guys helped these little lovely bug creatures to, um, to establish bases here on Earth. So they've got a couple of big bases here on Earth. So because they're so tiny and there's so many of them, they're like the biggest quantity-wise species that's here on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lovely dog species that are merchants, and they have a base down in Australia that they were authorized to have in the, 
at that 161 conference. And all they do is, you know, buy up commodities and sell them off to the aliens out in space. So the aliens love, they love bling, they love chocolate, they love nice silks and things like that. They don't kidnap any humans, and they would love to be our friends because we could be good customers for them. Hmm. So, well, let me ask you this: they, 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 are, they do talk about, and other people have brought this up too, non-human species who work with our military, who has helped develop things that we use every day, such as the microwave, cell phones, yeah. things of that nature. Yeah. What do you know about that, and how can you enlighten some of the listeners tonight? I don't, I don't know a lot, but I know that that's true because a, a lot of times Mark and I'll be talking, and you know, he'll just kind of bring it up. So you know, we've. We've used their technology, and they've shared their technology for lots of things. So, our you know our computer stuff probably wouldn't have moved along as fast without their help or without their technology. Our, our probably our, our spacecraft and you know the military spacecraft developments might not have happened you know as fast or you know without some of their technology, and certainly our cell phones. You know that's using that is using alien technology so you know i don't have a lot of specifics on any one thing but um but yeah you're right <laughs> okay. um any inside information uh, on area 51 is that still something that is operational today or it's not as active as it used to be yeah it's my impression that it's not as active because so many people have leaked out information about what was there that I think the majority of that was taken somewhere else and I don't really know where else. And it's it's interesting because his dad his dad was never stationed there. Mark's been in and out of there. Um, his dad was usually stationed and you can follow his orders at places where there was alien activity around the planet. And whether the public knew that or not. But his dad was stationed at Wright Patterson and, and most people know that, you know, that you know, it was a hotbed of alien stuff, and or especially storage. And and Mark, when he was when he was like two or three, they were stationed there at Wright Patterson in Ohio. And he wrote, he dictated this cute little story to his mom about going to work with Daddy one day, riding down under the ground in an elevator, and seeing little green men. I was like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> hmm. And knowing Mark, it's like. He wouldn't have written that or, or dictated that to his mother if that's not what he had just seen at work with Daddy that day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what would an underground like, base potentially look like? Would it just look like a big hotel underground or not necessarily? Well, considering I've never seen one, you know, there's there are some pictures on the Internet of at least like the tunnels and the roads running around downtown or like the train systems. Mm -hmm. But um, other than what I've seen on the Internet, I don't really know because he doesn't talk about what they look like. Um, he's been in plenty of underground bases. And, you know, the underground bases are not always alien. Sometimes the militaries just have underground bases, especially if there's top secret work going on. Mm -hmm. And... You know, it's obviously, and in my opinion, it's probably easier to keep them safe if they're underground rather than having everything that's important above uh -huh. ground where you could bomb the heck out of it. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think um, we really are on the break of a potential World War Three, or do you think a lot of that stuff's made up to be able to continue to do what is going on? I guess, in other words, to keep the public <clears throat> eye focused someplace else. The government is always really good at keeping us focused on someplace else that might be important. Oh, I forgot to put the cats upstairs. Um, so I, I don't have a, an opinion on whether we're about to have World War III. I know that Mark and I discuss, you know, a lot of things that are happening, like either in the Middle East, because that's a big problem, or um, like in, with the North Korea stuff. And so I would say, and I don't know if World War III is the right answer, but, you know, people keep talking about disclosure, and, um, you know, that's never going to come from Trump's lips. But what, what I say to people is, you know, if you want disclosure sooner than later, it might not be pretty. You know, it might come in the form of, like, a huge battle, for example, and the aliens need to come and help us. And then it's not going to be pretty, and you might not be happy about what you find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, 
So, so who knows? I think I, I. Sorry, I think I'm yelling. I think I get very excited about this. Can you tell? That's, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I what I what I know is currently on this planet there's a lot of problems with negative aliens and if we don't get it under control number 1 we might have disclosure and number 2 it is not going to be pretty and and I've learned just cuz I live in earthquake California that you need to have emergency supplies so you know if so I when they talk about like um the false invasion, or what, however it is they word it, you know, I don't know when or or whatever, but I I do hear from several friends who keep on the pulse of things, and not from Mark even, um, you know, that that things you know might be happening sooner than later, and so I don't know because I don't want to like freak people out, so I don't have a definitive answer for that. Okay. I just know that there is negative things, you know, if they don't get Syria and Iraq or Iran under control. You know, things could go bad quickly because mm-hmm. the aliens that are involved there are in huge numbers. Mm-hmm. Now, so, at one time, yeah. the Pope, not very long ago, did mention that they, the Vatican was going to come forth and clean about UFO activity. Um, <laughs> did you remember hearing anything about that or not necessarily? Uh, I, I can't remember, but, you know, the, and I, I can't remember them saying that. Um, I'm not saying they didn't. I just can't remember it. But, you know, the Vatican has a couple of observatories because they're always interested in anything UFO related. Mm-hmm. And, you know, over the years throughout his Mark's, throughout Mark's military careers, you know, he used to have access to the Vatican archives and he would meet with Vatican people, like if he was off on a mission to go retrieve some kind of down craft or debris or, you know, so the Vatican's very much in the know about alien stuff so are all the leaders or the leaders of all the major world churches are all in the know about alien stuff and you know i know the vatican helps the military the mormons help the military and i don't know what other religions help the military but those are the two i do know have helped the military over the years so they're very much in the know they're just not going to preach it from the pulpit (laughs) just do it so, yeah. Here's a question I think our listeners may have a, an interest in knowing. Sure. Is our planet at a potential for an attack or an invasion? Do we have a threat, a potential threat that could be coming in the near future, or do we have things pretty stable? <laughs> Again, <laughs> well, it, I, I'm going to back back up for a minute because it's, it's amazing – how many invasion attempts happened like when I was a young adult? There's two or three missions I know Mark was involved with when there were literally invasion forces, alien invasion forces in the 70s coming towards the planet that our military had to deal with, and mm-hmm. they did. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we're not as well equipped as we let the aliens think we are. So hopefully there's no aliens listening to this. <laughs> But um, so I, I don't know. But again, I know that even and sometimes the aliens are, are dealing with their own problems out in space, you know, and are battling one another. And that doesn't always affect this planet. But, you know, our planet is a wonderful resource of like minerals and, you know, just wonderful things like that. Water, minerals. We're a great vacation spot. You know, we've got lots of yummy humans that are good to experiment on. We're also in a very strategic location if you need to get from point A in space to point B. We're a great, and there's probably a scientific term for it, but I don't know it. Mm -hmm. We're in just this great um, spot if you need to, like, navigate to another part of space. You know, we're kind of like a bouncing off point, and... um, so I don't know if that's one reason why somebody might attack us. I don't have any great inside information. Mark's probably not going to tell me, you know, oh, this spaceship will be here tomorrow or the attack's going to happen tomorrow. He's not going to tell me that, mm-hmm. even if he knew. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, Obviously, and I probably ahead, wouldn't say if he did, you know. <laughs> well, what I was going to ask is some people are probably yeah. wondering, how does Mark communicate with you now? And I was going to give you an opportunity to try to explain to someone how, you know, whether it's telephones oh, sure. or, or, or letters. 
Uh, no, we, 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 the inmates are not allowed to have cell phones. So, you know, some of them do have them, not my husband, but, you know, because the guards will sell them to them for a high price. Mm -hmm. And then they find, they do searches and they find them and they get in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, so then they collect them and then they got new ones to sell again. You know, it's a, it's a crazy racket. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark and I write letters to each other pretty much every day. He, right now he's only an hour away from me, so I go visit him every weekend. Okay. And other places he's been, as long as he's been, like, within three hours or less, I would go visit him every weekend. Now, sometimes I'm off visiting my grandchildren, and sometimes I'm off at a UFO conference, and he doesn't get a visit. But most most every week he gets a visit. Um, and he calls me sometimes, but he usually saves his phone call time for his kids. Because, you know, again, I see him all the time. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. That's that's how we communicate. <laughs> no, I'm just there's no email. He doesn't he doesn't have access to the internet, so there's no email. I need you know. Yeah. What about right. less than five minutes email. left in the program? Oh, um, would okay. You, would you care to give wow. out some information about yourself, your company, your work that you're doing, sure. how somebody might want to get sure. in touch with you, things of that nature? Okay. Well, the website I have two. One is edhca.org for Earth Defense Headquarters, California. The other one is EDHQ for Earth Defense Headquarters dot org, and you know my contact information is all there. People are welcome to call me, email me. I have reports that Mark has written about various missions and conferences that we sell. And I have I'll you know be speaking at several locations throughout between now and the end of the year. I'll be at a couple of conferences to just sell the materials. But I'm, I'm very open and e easy to talk, well, easy to talk to, but easy to contact. And, you know, I'm happy to discuss things over Internet or, you know, by phone calls or whatever. So if anybody has questions, so that's it. You know, my, my mission is to just share as much information about alien species that I can because it's not all scary and a lot of it's really fun to learn. And, you know, I, I want to have an open, friendly relationship with as many species as possible. And, have, sit down and have tea and tea and scones with them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone listening to the program, they're starting to wrap it up. They're trying to decipher yeah. all of this. This is a lot of stuff to take in. It's really <laughs> new to them. It is. Yeah. What can you tell our listeners in this last two to three minutes that would give them a piece of comfort or hope to let them know that, you know, maybe they just need to rewatch Men in Black all over again. You know, something that can give them a little basis to grip all this and try to take it in. That would be good. Abyss is good. I love Jurassic World. The Raptors helped fund Jurassic World. But, you know, I, I have some basic reports about just alien species and things. The thing I would like people to know is that there are lots of alien species. Yes, they are real. Yes, many of them do come visit the planet. Most of them don't. Um, they're not all they're not all mean and unfriendly. You know, several of them are very friendly, and just like anything else, I think it's worth looking at just as an educational and scientific point. You know, how did you know they get here, and why did they why have they come here, and what are they like? The the stories I hear about the raptors are so fascinating because they look like scary dinosaurs, but they have families. They're very spiritual. You know, just there's so much good information to know, and you know, this is this is this was their planet first, and I I would like to be friends with some of these things, just you know, just cause, <laughs> you know. So it's not all scary and and awful, and you know, there are people out there I know who've had positive alien encounters. So, mm -hmm. you know. Miss Miss Joanne, I want to thank you for coming on the air tonight. Um, it's you been bet. a pleasure hearing this. Uh, I wrote a lot of notes. I didn't get a chance to ask every question <laughs> that I wanted, so obviously I want to get you back on the show at a later date. Great. Um, please keep in touch with me as well. If uh, sure. you know, Miss Mister Richards, uh, get you some new information, something that you think might okay. be important to share. Um, yeah. I would love and to have you, you on. If you ever have a conference in uh, New Orleans, I, I'll be there. <laughs> uh, we are working on some things at WBUZ95.com. Cool. We are trying to put some things together that probably would cool. be able to assist those things, you know. Great. But once Great. again, I want to thank you for coming on. Don't go anywhere. As soon as we get out there, like okay. you had a chance to chat with you. I want to thank everyone sure. for tuning in tonight. I am Alfred Adams, and you have listened to That's Unbelievable.